Well, thank you all so much. What a wonderful venue to have, and what a great thing that, that uh, these ex extraordinary creative people have brought to all of us here in Houston. Uh, I've been doing this survey for 29 years, so then I, I've really got to, they've given me only 20 minutes to talk about this remarkable transformation. I get unfairly credited with having planned to spend my life studying Houston. It fell in my lot back in 1982 to teach a research methods class to sociology majors. Houston was booming. One million people had moved into Harris County between 1970 and 1982. We were riding the oil boom. 82% of all the jobs in the city were tied into the oil business. The price of a barrel of Texas oil was selling for $3.20 in 1970. When it was selling for $33.50 in 1982, Houston's prime industrial products had increased tenfold in value. With no lessening of world demand, this was boomtown America. It was also a city world famous for having imposed the least amount of controls on development of any city in the Western world. <laughs> Growing problems developing, but who cares? Come on down and make money. We, we did a, a one-time survey to sort of measure how people were dealing with this incredible growth, but also growing problems of, 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 of traffic and pollution and crime. Did a one-time survey, never occurred to us to do it again. Two months later, the oil boom collapsed. Price of oil had been at $32.50, fell down to $28, but Houston had been building and borrowing on the basis of $50 oil, and 100,000 jobs were lost. By the end of 1983, we said, my God, we better do this survey again. And for 29 years, my students and I have been taking a representative random sample of Harris County residents reached by random telephone numbers, a random adult in each random household, asking people with identical questions over the years, how do you see the world? What is happening in your life? And we have sat back and watched the world change. Houston went into major recession uh, and then recovered into a restructured economy and a demographic revolution. This new economy, suddenly the source of wealth from now on is going to have less and less to do with, with natural resources and more to do with human resources. The blue collar path to economic security has disappeared. The big employers in Houston in the 1970s was Hughes Tool Company, Cameron Iron Works, good blue collar jobs, some of the strong right arm and willingness to work hard. Those jobs have disappeared. Gone forever is a chance for a young man or woman to graduate from American high school with a high school diploma, come out into the Houston or American workforce, and expect to be able to make a middle class wage. What you earn depends on what you have learned. Education has become critical. We are watching a growing gap between rich and poor predicated above all else on access to quality higher education. One example in Houston, we have the greatest medical complex in the world, the Texas Medical Center, and we have the highest percentage of children without health insurance of any major city in America. That gap between rich and poor is part of the central challenge for us as we go forward in building a viable society in the 21st century. And the other aspect of this new economy is, okay, the source of wealth during the 20th century had everything to do with Houston's location in the East Texas oil fields. What will be the source of wealth for Houston in the 21st century? And the answer is biotech, bio-nanotech. With nanotechnology advice, superconductivity, U of H, bio-nano-infotech, bio-nano-info-envirotech. The, the source... The source of wealth for Houston in the 21st century will have to do with attracting the best and the brightest people in America, able, able to put, put their knowledge, to, uh, cutting edge knowledge into commercial ventures. The source of wealth in the 21st century knowledge economy is housed between the ears of the best and the brightest people in America who can live anywhere. And suddenly quality of life issues that were never important for Houston, come on down and make money, are suddenly central to economic prosperity for Houston in the 21st century. One quick example is air pollution. I think it's fair to say through the 1990s, the business community in Houston was basically saying, we're doing fine with our air pollution problems. Thank you very much. We've been making progress every year. The EPA has promulgated draconian regulations based on bogus science. If we even try to come into compliance with those regulations, it's going to destroy the local economy. We're going to get the EPA off our backs. That was the dominant view of the business community, I think, until a fateful date, October 7th, 1999. The headline in the USA Today newspaper on that hot and balmy day was New, it was Houston, cough, cough. We've got a problem, cough, cough. And the, head, <laughs> the headline in the LA Times was New Smog Capital of America Declared. That was the day when for the first time in history, Houston surpassed Los Angeles in a number of dangerously polluted days. And today, to a person, the business community in Houston and all of its public and private pronouncements now declares that environmental regulations, far from being anti-growth and anti-business, are essential to economic prosperity for Houston in the 21st century. You're saying people, one of the things in our surveys is, you know, people complain about traffic, they complain about pollution, they complain about the weather, and we say, well, how would you rate the Houston area in general as a place to live? It's a wonderful place to live. <laughs> people, 
people who, who live in Houston and love this place for a whole variety of very powerful reasons. Our problem, as we indicated, is people from outside Houston say, yuck, why would you want to live in Houston? And the great challenge for, for, for Houston's Positioning itself for prosperity in the 21st century is to transform itself into a destination of choice, a place where people who can live anywhere will say, I want to live in Houston. So one aspect of this new reality that we've been watching is just fascinating. It's a 19th century business-oriented city committed above all else to economic prosperity, prepared to roll up its sleeves and reinvent itself for prosperity in the 21st century. And a recognition that this is a different world than the 20th century was when our location in the East Texas oil fields counted for everything in our economic prosperity. And I tell people, you know, boy, if that's all that was happening in Houston, that would be plenty to keep sociologists like me fascinated as you watch the city coming to grips with these new realities. But at that very same moment, of course, and this is what I wanted to talk about quickly, has come this remarkable, fundamental, irreversible transformation in the ethnic composition of the Houston, the Texas, and the American population. And what I want to do in the moments I have is to just suggest to us how and why is it happening now? Why here? What's going on? Where is it taking us? What does it all mean for us? And just as quickly as I can, remind us of, these, of, of those realities. Between 1492, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and 1965, when LBJ was still alive. Ooh, the... <laughs> Be between 1492 and 1965, 82 percent of all the human beings on the face of this earth who came to these shores came from Europe. We were an amalgam of European nationalities. Another 12 percent of the population were Africans originally brought here as slaves to serve the Europeans. And there was a handful of Chinese and Japanese working as farmers and laborers in California and Hawaii. This was an amalgam of European nationalities, and we were operating under the last 40 years of that period, between 1924 and 1965, under one of the most viciously racist laws the U.S. Congress ever passed, the National Origins Quota Act. And it came out of the great anti-immigrant racist backlash that accompanied the last great wave of immigration when 15.9 million people came here between 1890 and 1914. Here is a measure, uh, an indication from the census of the number of immigrants coming to this country in each of the decades in the 1820s to 2000. Here we were at the beginning, one third of all the inhabitants of the United States when we won our independence from, from Britain, one third were, were African slaves, about 80% of the whites were British subjects. We won our independence and then in the 1840s came the Irish, right, the Irish, the potato family. I need to remind you what we thought of the Irish and then some, some French and Germans are coming down. There's a little dip with the Civil War in the 1860s, another dip over here with the recession of, of 1897. 15.9 million immigrants came here between 1890 and 1914, coming from Europe, but not coming from where real Americans were supposed to come, Northern Europe. They were Southern and Eastern Europe, and they weren't Protestants, they were Catholics and Jews, and they had no history of democracy. They're coming to take our jobs and destroy our country. We've got to stop them. <laughs> Literally. And in 1924, Congress enacted this incredible act that said, all right, from now on, you can come to this country in direct proportion to which your ethnicity and nationality was represented in the census of 1890 to give major preference to Northern Europeans and use the new science of psychology in the IQ test to declare in the act, science has proven that there are three subspecies of the white race. The Nordics, who are biologically and intellectually superior to the Alpines, who in turn are superior to the Mediterraneans, and all of them are superior to the Jews and the Asians. And the law codified the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, the Gentlemen's Agreement with Japan in 1906, to declare in the act, Asians are an inferior subspecies of humanity ineligible from ever becoming American citizens, and Asians were banned entirely from coming to America. It was a law of the land through the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. You see what happened to immigration? It plummeted. This is, of course, the Great Depression. I tell people you really want to stop immigration, engineer a Great Depression. 28% unemployment, <laughs> people stopped coming. And, and, and indeed, there's been a slight drop, as you know, in, in immigration the last couple of years because of the Great Recession that we're in the midst of now. But 98% of all the immigrants who came here between that law of, the, uh, of 1924 and the time it was finally changed in 1965, 98% came from Europe, 88% of them from Northern Europe, just as the act intended. The act could not survive the shifts of consciousness with the civil rights movements, Kennedy's assassination, and in 1965, Congress changed the law. He says, all right, we used to be a racist nation. We're not racist anymore. We'll give every country recognized by the UN 20,000 visas a year, regardless of their ethnicity or nationality. So get off my back. We're not racist. 
but we'll continue the hallmark of American immigration policy, which is family reunification, right? If you're the father, mother, sister, brother, son or daughter of an American citizen, you can come to the head of the line. Therefore, said Congress, not to worry. The ethnic composition of Americans are going to change. We're going to give preference to people related to those who are already here. We're just getting this racist law off the books. Basically, everyone believed immigration was a thing of our past. America was now complete. Uh, and now we're just, we're just regularizing the laws that, we've, that we established during the earlier period of American history. Then we added another provision. They said, well, obviously, if you're a professional of exceptional ability, or if you have skills that are demonstrably needed in the short supply, you too can come to the head of the line. And Congress, in its debates in the late 50s and early 60s, was saying, we need to open the door for some more British doctors, some more German engineers. It never occurred to anyone that there were going to be African doctors, Indian engineers, Chinese computer programmers who would be able for the first time in the 20th century to come to America. The law was changed in 1965 and called one of the great inadvertent acts that the U.S. Congress has ever passed <laughs> in, in, in a body known for its inadvertent acts and its unintended consequences. The world changed. During the 1960s, three and a half million immigrants came to this country, only 34% were coming from Europe. In the 1970s, 5 million immigrants came, only 18% were Europeans. In the 1980s, about 10 million immigrants came. In the 1990s, 11 and a half million new immigrants came to this country, 88% coming from Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Caribbean. And the United States, that throughout all of its history had been an amalgam of, of European nationalities, is rapidly becoming a microcosm of the world. The first nation in history that can say, we are a free people, and now we come from everywhere. And it's a remarkable change. Happy the same moment as the American economy is becoming fully integrated into a single global world economic system, facing global challenges, America a microcosm of the world. Immigration is network driven. Not all parts of the country are getting the, are experiencing it at the same rate. Uh, you, go, you go where you know people. There are two cities, Los Angeles and New York, that are the great immigration capitals of America. One third of all the foreign-born residents in the United States live in or around those two cities, Los Angeles and New York, followed by lesser magnet cities, Miami, San Francisco, Chicago, Houston, followed right after Houston by San Diego, Washington, D.C., Dallas, Boston, Atlanta, and now spreading to every city and town across America. No city has been transformed as fully, as completely, as irreversibly, as suddenly as Houston, Texas. Throughout all of our history, it's absolutely fair to say we were a biracial southern city dominated and controlled in an automatic, taken for granted way by white men. In the space of the last 20 years, we become one of the most ethnically and culturally diverse cities in the country. Here are the census figures for Harris County in each of the last five decades and the census estimates for 2000 and 2008. Uh, here we were, that biracial world in 1960. 74% of us were, were Anglos, 20% African Americans, just 6% Hispanics, two, less than one half of 1% were Asians. During the oil boom of the 70s, it was Anglos pouring into this city because this is where the jobs were while the rest of you guys up in the Northeast were having your stagflating 70s. We were booming. And by 1980, Houston had become the fourth largest city in America. Still an overwhelmingly Anglo city. 63% Anglo, 20% African American, 16% Hispanic, 2% Asian. The Anglo population during the height of the oil boom in the 1970s grew by 27%. Then came the oil bust. And between 1980 and 1990, the Anglo population grew by 1%. Between 1990 and 2000, the Anglo population actually dropped by 6.3%. There were fewer Anglos in Harris County in 2000 than in 1990. During that last decade, meanwhile, the African American population grew by 22%, the Hispanic population by 74%, the Asian population by 76%. And by the year 2000, there were 3.4 million people in Harris County, Texas, all of us minorities in a truly remarkable transformation. In the census estimates for 2010, I trust you've all sent in your, your census forms. <laughs> it's going to be a real challenge to count all the Latinos. You know, you can, I'm from the government and you can trust me. Tell me how many people live in your house. Uh, <laughs> we, it's a tr tremendous challenge. It's critically important to have as full a count as you can possibly have. But the census, by 2010, the census says, we, we, we expect that the Anglo population will be less than one third of the entire population of Harris County. And, and, the, and the Hispanic population will be over 40%. Wow, no city has been transformed as rapidly as that. Let me just touch on a few quick things here. Had Houston not been one of the great magnets for the new immigration of the last 25 years, this city would have lost population. We would have had the same fate as other major American cities across the country that are losing their status as major cities. 
Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, St. Louis, Detroit, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Buffalo. Instead, Houston is one of the most vibrant, rapidly growing cities in America with a tremendous entrepreneurial economy purely because of its attraction to extraordinary, high, high intelligent, uh, healthy, ambitious, energetic immigrants pouring into the city from Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Caribbean. No city has benefited more from immigration than Houston, Texas. I think it's probably fair to say. Another interesting point is that Houston has a more even distribution among the four great communities of America than any of the other multi-ethnic melting pot cities. There are very few Asians in Miami. There are very few Hispanics in San Francisco. There are very few African Americans in Los Angeles. This is where the four communities meet in greater balance, greater equality, all of us minorities, all of us called on to build something new under the sun, a truly successful, inclusive, multi-ethnic society that will be Houston and Texas and America in the 21st century. One other final quick point here is, Houston is about three and a half years ahead of Texas. In August of 2004, the census announced Texas has now joined California as the two largest states in the union, both of which are now majority minority states. For the first time in the history of the Texas Republic, the majority of Texans trace their ancestry to somewhere else on the planet than to Europe. There are two other majority minority states that have had that status for a long time, New Mexico and of course Hawaii, and the census says hold on to your hats. We think when we get the final count in 2010, there will be 10 to 12 majority minority states. Illinois, New York, Florida, Georgia, and by 2040, the entire population of the United States will be majority minority. By 2040, this nation that had been an amalgam throughout all of its history, deliberately so, of European nationalities, will, will the majority of Americans will no longer trace their ancestry to Europe. So one of the things I tell people is, whoa, the American future is here in Houston now. And it seems to me fair to say how we navigate this transition will have enormous significance, not just for the Houston future, but for the American future. This is where the American future is gonna be worked out. And it's what makes what's happening in this city and how we navigate this process in the next 10 to 15 years of transcendent importance, it seems to me, because it's hard to imagine Los Angeles or Chicago, New York or, or Miami doing a better job of building the America of the 21st century. Another critical piece in all of this is, of course, it's not just numbers, it's also ages, right? We are living longer, healthier lives than human beings have ever lived in the history of human life on this planet. Doctors will tell you that age 65 back in 1965 is the equivalent of age 74 today. You reach 65 in good health in America, you have a quarter of your life still ahead of you. Sociologists talk about the young old. You don't get to be old old now until you're in your late 70s, late 80s, early 90s. We chose 65 as a time when you were old and were supposed to retire back in 1906 when 7% of Americans lived to the age of 65. We said, well, my gosh, you make it to 65, you deserve to be taken care of by the rest of us for those couple of months you had to go fishing or to sit on your porch. <laughs> so, Incredible expansion of life, right? uh, and it, all, I, mean, I tell my students, you graduate from Rice at the age of 21, you have 60 years of vigorous adult life ahead of you. What are you going to do with those 60 years? And the old idea that you have the one life, one career imperative, that you're going to decide what you're going to do at the age of 20 and do that nonstop full time until you're 65 and then retire with a pension, not likely to be a part of the 21st century. It's fascinating to sort of think about what lives will be as, a, as we, we are all condemned, if that's the right word, to continual learning, to continual growth as, as life proceeds. A lot of things to talk about there, but the critical point for us is that it is Anglos that are, who are overwhelmingly disproportionately overrepresented among the senior folk in America because they were the ones who've been born here in the 20s and 30s and, and early 40s and be moving into senior status. And we have not seen anything yet. 76 million babies were born in this country between 1946 and 1964 in that incredible period after World War II when the rising tide did indeed lift, lift all boats, when the average American man, wherever he was on the up escalator, literally doubled his income in real terms between 1950 and 1970, getting, doing, making more money every year. And those were the years when we celebrated the stay-at-home housewife mother in suburbia. The average American woman gave birth to 3.6 children. The average American woman gave birth to 3.6 children in that period. And the baby boom was launched upon the land, preceded and followed by baby bus generations. So, so it's been a bulge in the system all the way along there. Doc, the demographers talk about it. 
like a pig being swallowed by a python. <laughs> Not very healthy, they tell us, either for the pig or the python. <laughs> the leading edge of those baby boomers turned 64 this year. And we are going to watch a literal doubling in the number of Americans over the age of 65 in the next 25 years. The entire po age population of America is going to be more skewed in the direction of old folks than the population of Florida is today. <laughs> Our politics are going to be preoccupied with concerns about Social Security and Medicare and access to Botox. You can see it all coming. <laughs> it is Anglos who are overwhelmingly disproportionately overrepresented among the baby boom generation because they were the ones to have been born here between 1946 and 1964. It was not until 1965 and for the first time in the 20th century, large numbers of non-Europeans were allowed to come to America. So the young people across all of America are disproportionately non-Anglo, as the old folks are disproportionately Anglo. Nowhere is that clearer than in Houston, because Houston is a city of migrants. And you migrate when you're a young man or woman looking for new opportunities for your family. We were a city, as we've seen, of Anglo migrants during the oil boom. And for the last 25 years, we have been a city of non-Anglo migrants. And so here is a powerful picture of Houston's present and future. Of all the people we reach in our random samples who are 60 years old or older, 67% are Anglos, 19% in that age group are African Americans, 11% Hispanics, 2% Asians. And each younger age group, especially after the baby boom, sitting right here, ages 45 to 59, the percentage of Anglos plummets. The percentage of African Americans, Asians, and above all Hispanics surges. You reach the young adults in Harris County, Texas today, age 18 to 29, 45% are Hispanics, 23% African Americans, 8, 9% are Asians, fewer than 24% are Anglos. You go a little further to the children of HISD, in, uh, children of, you know, granted Anglo kids are more likely to be in the suburbs or in, in uh, in private schools, but of all the 200,000 kids currently enrolled in HISD classrooms from kindergarten to senior year in high school, 61% are Latino kids and 28% are African American. 89% of the children of Houston are African American and Latino. The two groups overwhelmingly the most likely to be living in poverty. 79% of all the kids in HISD classrooms today qualify for reduced cost or free lunch programs. We know what poverty does to your ability to succeed in the public schools. And it is a safe statement to make that if Houston's African-American and Latino young people are unprepared to succeed in the knowledge economy of the 21st century, it is hard to envision a prosperous future for Houston. The central challenge of our time comes down to that question of, are we prepared to ensure that we can provide the kind of education that is going to be critical for success for the people who will be the workers and, 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 uh, and taxpayers and citizens and voters of Houston and Texas in the 21st century? A couple of quick other things. I know I've got to stop in just a second. The, uh, this is a done deal. Close the borders tomorrow. Not another immigrant comes to these shores. 60-year-old Anglos are not going to be making a whole lot more babies. I, 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 I tell everybody, we'll do the best we can. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll work on it every chance we get. <laughs> You can go to the bank on this. Every business is going to figure out either how to capitalize on the burgeoning diversity of Houston or find it harder to grow their business as the 21st century unfolds. Every major institution in the city was necessarily and inevitably built by, for, and on behalf of Anglos. Every one of them has to transform itself to become Houston's institution in the 21st century. Uh, I'm reminded of Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the, the, the late senator from New York, always used to say, everyone's entitled to their own opinions, but they're not entitled to their own facts. And if there's a single fact about Houston, it has something to do with this chart. No force in the world is going to stop Houston or Texas or America from becoming more Latino, more African American, more Asian, and less Anglo as the 21st century unfolds. This ethnic transformation can be the greatest asset that Houston could have as it positions itself in the global economy, a gateway to Latin America, the second largest port in the country, the sixth largest port in the world, the Houston port. Tell me, just because we're 50 miles from the ocean doesn't mean we can't have a port, right? <laughs> so, but that port locks us into becoming a world center for trade and commerce in the global economy. It's gonna be an enormous asset for Houston to have, to be a microcosm of the world, to have in positions of economic and political power, black Houstonians, Hispanic Houstonians, Asian Houstonians, to build the bridges to the global marketplace. This ethnic transformation can be the greatest asset that Houston could have or it could tear us apart and become a major liability, reducing rather than enhancing our competitiveness in the global economy. 
It's a fascinating kind of moment. We are at this hinge in history where literally 70% of everybody over 60 is Anglo and more than 75% of everybody under 30 is not Anglo. And here we are at that remarkable place where the future will be shaped by the kinds of decisions that we collectively make. Let me end this. I've got to have some other things, but 20 minutes are up. End this with two sources of wisdom from ancient China, right? One is that famous Chinese curse when you were angry in the old days in China, people would say, darn you, may you live in interesting times. <laughs> <laughs> Meant as a curse. These are, I think, the most, I, can't, I don't think there have ever been more interesting times than right here and right now. And then there's that wonderfully insightful way that the Chinese language renders the word for crisis. Right? The word for crisis in Chinese is wei ji, consists of two characters, one signifying danger and the other opportunity. Not a bad way to think about this remarkable coming together for a set of cards that this generation has been dealt. No one planned for the oil boom to collapse, for Houston to go into a major recession and then recover into a radically different economy where, where education has become so critical, where quality of life issues are now essential to prosperity for Houston in the 21st century, and no one planned for the ethnic transformation to take place. Here it is. These are the cards that this generation has been dealt. How we play those cards, with what kind of sensitivity, determination to seize the opportunities and derail the dangers will be the measure of the kind of city, the kind of state, the kind of country that we build together in the 21st century. Thank you all very, very much. Great, great pleasure to be here.